All right. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see uh, the few, the brave, and the healthy here. Um, it's great to have everybody here. I'm Trevor Van Schooneveld. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you today. Um, you can take notes on whatever piece of paper you can find. Um, so we don't have uh, notes like Steve said. Um, before we start, I do just want to pray. I know there's a number of people so, who are out, who are sick, uh, uh, quite a number actually. So I just want to pray for them before we start and pray for the message. Lord, we do just think of all those who are unwell, who are sick, Lord. We pray they recover quickly, Lord. We pray you just protect us from illness, God. We thank you for how you have cared for us. Lord, we do just pray for the message today, Lord, that it would be just what you want me to share, God, that I'd only share what you want, that you keep my mouth shut on things I shouldn't say, God. I pray that your word would go out in power and strength, God, and be put into practice. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so who loves New Year's resolutions? Uh, yeah, right, I get it, yes, I feel the same way. Uh, who likes New Year's goals? Oh, yeah, there are some people who like goals, right? So, um, you know, maybe you don't, I don't like making resolutions, but the New Year is a good time to reassess things, right? There's nothing wrong with reassessing things. Our natural tendency is to just keep doing the same thing we're doing and to not like say, boy, maybe I, I should change some things a little bit, right? It's easy when you're like, man, I feel horribly bloated after the holidays and hideously fat to say, man, I should really probably exercise some more. I, I felt that way. Maybe you felt that way. Um, but I think it's important that we regularly assess kind of where we're going as people. What is our trajectory for our life and see if it needs correcting? And that's an important question that we need to ask. And I want to start with a very interesting scientific story. So this uh, is the Rosetta probe. It was launched in March of 2004 from a rocket base in French Guiana. It was created by the European Space Agency. And the goal of the Rosetta probe was to land on a comet, which is a rather ambitious probe. The Earth, uh, it was launched, it circled the Earth, it went around Mars, it went around the asteroid belt, and after 10 years in space, it caught up with this Chernyamov whatever comet. Okay? These are actual pictures from the probe uh, when it was at the comet. And what it did when it got to this comet is it actually landed another smaller probe onto the comet. And the goal was for it to be on the comet and do a bunch of not experiments, but send a bunch of data back. Unfortunately, the comet was a little different in consistency than they expected, and the probe bounced a couple of times and bounced right into a shadow. And so after 48 hours, the probe ran out of juice because you got to have uh, uh, solar energy there. Did find some interesting things out when it was there. Uh, pretty much debunked the idea that uh, comets brought water to Earth, which was kind of a, pfft, an idea anyway. Um, but what I think was really, I mean, it's, it's amazing, right? They shot this probe off from Earth, and they got to a comet. And what I want to show you is the, so the probe is the purple circle there. Blue, the dark blue is Earth. The red is Mars. The, like, green and yellow is asteroids. And the, the like, bright green is the comet. And so what I'd point out is this went on over 10 years to meet up with that comet. And it's going to circle around here. You can see it goes around the Earth, and then it goes around Mars. And you'll see at one point, it's a billion kilometers from where it needs to get. A billion kilometers. And yet, through some really amazing physics and math, they put this probe right next to the comet. So the trajectory of this probe was amazing. They had to slingshot it around the planets and using gravity, and a simple small navigational error of 1% of even 0.01% could have just crashed this probe onto a planet or sent it hurtling off into space. And its trajectory was set by the rocket and the gravity and some little adjustment jets. But this probe had a really carefully programmed trajectory. And if it was off, it would have missed its goal. So what is a trajectory? Trajectory is a path following, followed by a projectile flying or an object moving under the action of giving forces. And so where does this apply to what we're going to talk about today? 
Well, our lives are on a trajectory. We are going somewhere. Rory talked about resolutions last week in Psalm 145. If you put those resolutions Rory talked about into place, they will change the trajectory of your life. As we practice those things, we become different people. They will be forces acting on us for good, adjusting our trajectory. And so the question really is, what is the trajectory of your life? And that's, I think, what resolutions or goals are about. We sometimes need some trajectory corrections. You know, I think we all want to live successful lives and fruitful lives. We want to be successful in our work, our relationships, our parenting, our finances. We want to be fulfilled. We want to be content. Uh, and I think we desire to honor God in all those areas. I doubt that anyone starts out a relationship saying, boy, by the end of this relationship, I really hope we hate each other. That's where I want to get to. And people don't set five-year financial plans where they say, by the end of five years, I plan to have a back-breaking amount of debt and to be bankrupt. That's where I want to get to. People don't set out with those goals in mind. Yet the beliefs and actions that we take may lead us to those ends if we don't consider the trajectory of our lives and our choices. So how do we set the right trajectory? What I'm going to talk about today, if you put it into practice, will change the trajectory of your life. And there are many things that can help adjust our trajectory. Uh, people, church, prayer, many things. But I want to talk about what I think is the most important thing after our choice to follow Christ. On that note, if you've not made a decision to follow Christ, you are in desperate need of a trajectory correction. Jesus said there are two roads. There are two trajectories. One is wide and easy, and many are on it, and it leads to destruction. One is narrow. It is difficult, and few tread it, but it leads to eternal life. If you are on the wide and easy path, you need to make a change. Jesus offers the free gift of salvation to all who acknowledge their sinfulness and come to him confessing their sins and asking for forgiveness. If you've not made that decision, talk to me afterwards. Talk to somebody who invited you. But after that decision, I think the most important thing we can do to set ourselves on the right trajectory to successful life is to regularly take in God's word and put it into practice. God's word is essential for setting the right trajectory in our life and for correcting it when we get off on the wrong heading. If we want to hit the target, we need to set the right trajectory. And God's word is what is going to set that trajectory. So why do I say it is the most important thing for determining where we end up? How can I be so confident? Well, I want to show you a couple of Old Testament passages that make this point very strongly. In December, I was reading through Deuteronomy. I'd read through you know, Genesis and Exodus, and I'd gotten to Deuteronomy and then into Joshua. And I was really struck in those books about how many times Moses and God are like, hey, listen, Israelites, here's my laws, my statutes, my rules. You guys need to listen to them, and you need to do them. And really good things will happen to you if you do. And if you don't, Really bad things are going to happen to you over and over and over again. And I want to read what God tells Joshua um, as he's about to go into the promised land. Now, Joshua, if you remember, took over from Moses. Moses died. He'd been Moses' assistant. Joshua took over right before they were going to go into the promised land. And, uh, you know, he might have been a little you know, unsure about the trajectory of things. I don't know. Maybe he was very confident. But I think I might be, right? He might have been thinking, boy, you know, first we got to get across this flooded river, and then there's all these, like, um, you know, fortified cities we got to take over. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people here I have to manage. And, you know, Moses, like, talked to God face to face. That's not me. Um, and so he might have been questioning, you know, what's my trajectory as a leader going to do? How can I be a successful leader like Moses? And this is what God tells him in Joshua 1. Uh, one, uh, Joshua 1, six, uh, 6 through 9. 
Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be very strong and courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it from the right or to the left so that you will achieve success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will achieve success. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified or dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God tells Joshua right away, listen, don't worry. You're going to accomplish what I want you to. And then he tells Joshua, here is the key to your success as a leader. The key to your success is not, you know, six leadership strategies. The key to your success of being prosperous and achieving your goal is to take in God's word, to put it in your mind, to get it into your heart, to talk about it, to meditate on it, so that it brings you in line with what God desires. And then you need to put it into practice. And if you read the story of Joshua, that's exactly what he did. And he was tremendously successful. You can read through Deuteronomy, and I could show you four different passages, which I don't have time to do. But they all say the same thing. They all say, listen, here's God's commands. Remember them. Think about them. Do them. And there's amazing blessing that's going to come to you. Show you this Deuteronomy passage because I want to get on to Psalm 1. I love Psalm 1. We're hopefully going to teach you Psalms later this year, but I love Psalm 1. Psalm 1 talks about this. Let's read Psalm 1, verse 1 through 3. Blessed is a person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. Do you want to prosper in whatever you do? This is a promise from God. He says, if you want to prosper in whatever you do, you need to do two things. What's the first thing? Well, in verse 1, you need to stay away from sin. I love this verse where he talks about don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Don't, like, get advice from people who are foolish. They're wicked. They don't have good advice. Don't listen to them. Don't uh, um, stand in the path of sinners. Don't hang around them, right? They do wrong things. Bad company is going to corrupt good character. And don't sit in the seat of scoffers. Don't think. Don't assume the attitudes and philosophies of godless people. I would challenge you. There are many philosophies out there. If they're created by godless people who reject and hate God, they're probably not things that we should ascribe to. That's where it's not just the idea. It's the person who came up with the idea. You need to think about those things. So that's number one, avoid sin. But number two is we need to have a practice of taking in God's word. We need to let it permeate our heart and mind and transform us. Just like a tree by a stream, we need to drink deeply from God's word so it soaks into our heart and mind, and that's what's going to help to change our actions. And then I love this promise. It says, if you do that, you're like a tree planted by a stream. A tree planted by a stream doesn't run out of water, right? There's always water providing sustenance. It's not worried about withering when the sun comes or there's a dry spell. And not only that, it produces fruit. It blesses others with what it produces. And so these passages clearly show that God's word is essential for setting the right trajectory of our hearts and our actions. And the result of this is really blessing. So this is not prosperity gospel. This is what God says. God says if we do this, we will be blessed. Now that may not mean financially. There are lots of other blessings that God has. So hopefully it's essential that we Take in God's word. But why, why, what's unique about God's word? Why should I listen to that rather than other, you know, religious books? Or couldn't I just read, like, the top 20 self-help books and, like, figure out my life? And, you know, I read a little Tony Robbins, a little Covey, and, you know, get my habits all right. You know, get, get all that stuff done, and suddenly my, my life is good. You know, all the good ideas in these, 
come out of here. All the successful ideas in there, they come out of here. So why do we need God's word? Nothing wrong with these books. They can be helpful supplements. But the primary thing we need is this book. What is unique about the Bible? Well, I just want to give you four characteristics that are unique about the Bible and why we should look to this as a book that will actually help us be successful in our relationships, prosperous in our job. How is the Bible going to help us do it? Why can it do that? Well, I just four, there are many other great characteristics about the Bible. Uh, th I'm just going to recapitulate very briefly a couple things from our approachable theology because I think it's really relevant to why we should listen to the Bible. Why should we listen to the Bible? Well, first, the Bible is the inspired word of God. That means God wrote the whole thing. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. God wrote it, and it's useful and profitable for us. It is not the idea of men. You hear that over and over again. A whole bunch of weirdos in the you know, 400s wrote the Bible. That is an inaccurate statement. It is an untrue statement. The Bible says it is not the ideas of men. 2 Peter, knowing that first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In some mysterious, interesting way, the Holy Spirit worked through whole human authors to create exactly what God wanted. So the words that we have in the Bible are exactly what God wanted us to know. They're what he, what he wanted to communicate to us. It wasn't written by men, authored by God. So that leads us to the next two topics. Because it's authored by God, it is inerrant. It is completely truthful in all it teaches. It conforms to reality. It doesn't contradict itself, and it's self-consistent. We could talk for about five minutes on each one of those things. But the key thing is the Bible is not filled with errors. The people who tell you those things, ah, not true. Okay, It is not filled with errors but it has been under attack for many, many years. All three aspects of the Godhood attest to the truthfulness of Scripture. God, as, a, as God, is actually defined by truth. Number says, God is not human, that he should lie. He is not a human being, that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? God is different than you and me. He can't say something that's not true. He is defined by truthfulness. So his book that he wrote is completely true and accurate. Not only that, but Jesus spoke only what the Father said. And so he speaks truth as well. He said, so Jesus said, when they lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And I do nothing of my own, but I say these things as the Father instructed me. Interestingly, if you read what Jesus said, he clearly believed the Old Testament was true and accurate and was history. He talked about Adam and Eve, he talked about the flood, he talked about Noah, all some rather fantastic stories, but Jesus accepted these as absolutely true. And then the Holy Spirit, who helped to write all the Bible, but particularly the New Testament, says what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will speak on his own, for what, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. So the Holy Spirit speaks what God and Jesus want him to say only. So God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit all testify to the truthfulness of what's written in the Bible. It is true, it is inerrant, so we can put our trust in it. Now, not only is God's word inspired, not only is it inerrant, because of it being written by the Creator God and having no errors, it is also authoritative. That means it has the right to command Christians in what to believe, what to be, what to do, and what not to do. If you read the Bible, it repeatedly speaks with authority. In the Old Testament, over and over again, thus says the Lord, speaks with authority. You know, why does it have authority? It has authority because God has uniquely invested himself in this book. He has, is so aligned with this book that to obey this book is to obey God. And to disregard the Bible is exactly the same as disregarding God. God has fully invested himself in this book as his manifestation on earth right now. 2,000 years ago, we had Jesus. Not here right now. 
We have God's word, and what we do with God's word is very important because it is authoritative. So what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, if anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge the things I'm writing you are command of the Lord. Paul wrote, what I'm saying, this is what God is saying. He's not like, these are like some ideas I have. Like, like I might say, here's my thoughts. They're my thoughts. They're not God speaking. Paul says, what I wrote is what God says. And so the Bible has the authority to tell us what is true and not true, what is correct and incorrect, and what we should do and not do. And then finally, because the Bible is inerrant and authoritative and authored by God, and this is a characteristic I love, it has transformative power. It is unlike any of those other self-help books. Those self-help books will not change you. You can change some things about you, but they do not change the person that you are. God's word is amazing. This is what it says in, in Hebrew. Roy read this last week. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And yes, that is not a two-edged sword. I'm sorry for those sword aficionados. I should have put a two-edged sword up there. Piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word works on our heart to change us. It brings conviction of sin. It brings wisdom. It helps us to love God and others more. God's word breaks up our heart and heart. I love this verse from, Jer from Jeremiah. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks rocks and pieces. That's God's word. It's a fire. It's a hammer. It breaks pride and sin. It burns out the useful things in our lives. And like streams of living water, it nourishes us, producing good fruit. So with that picture of God's word in our mind, how do we get more of God's word? What should we do with it? The last part here, I really just want to talk practically about how to put this into practice. But I think the key thing is we need more of God's word. We need to take it in and we need to obey it. And I challenge you, if you are not someone who reads the Bible regularly, today is the day to start doing it. I have four thoughts on how we can take in more of God's word. And they're going to be pretty simple and straightforward. Read, study, memorize, apply. First, we need to read the Bible. Depending on what surveys you read, about a third of people in Protestant churches read the Bible daily. Only a third. I'd say it's higher at our church. Daily Bible reading needs to be part of your life. I, I just, there's no, it just has to be. We can't expect God's word to impact us unless we are reading it regularly. Um, let me read to you what John Blanchard says uh, in his book, um, How to Enjoy Your Bible. This is what he says. Surely we only have to be realistic and honest with ourselves to know how regularly we need to turn to the Bible. How often do we face problems, temptation, and pressure? Every day. Then how often do we need instruction, guidance, and great encouragement? Every day. To catch all those felt needs up into an even greater issue, how often do we need to see God's face, hear his voice, feel his touch, know his power? The answer to all these questions is the same every day. As the American evangelist D.L. Moody put it, a man can no more take in a supply of grace for the future than he can eat enough for the next six months or take sufficient air into his lungs at one time to sustain his life for a week. We must draw upon God's boundless store of grace from day to day as we need it. So I would strongly encourage you to read your Bible every day. I think that would be in line with what God's word has said. I will tell you, that is a decision that you will never regret. It's a decision that I made years ago. So I was not that consistent. I'll tell you, when we moved to Omaha about 20 years ago, I was not a consistent Bible reader. And I remember years ago, Rory gave me a little brochure. It was like how to have a seven-minute you know, quiet time or something. And when he gave it to me, I thought, huh, he must know I don't read the Bible that much or something. But he was encouraging me. Now, did I start reading my Bible after he gave me that little thing? I didn't. When did I start actually reading my Bible every day? Well, I started when I made a decision to discipline myself to do it. And I don't remember why. It was probably, again, Rory's preaching, convicting me. Man, I really do need to read my Bible every day. But what happened was I basically decided... I am going to read my Bible every day, even if it means I have to get up 20 minutes earlier, which was the major obstacle for me. 
I don't want to get up earlier and read my Bible. Um, and so that's what I started to do. I just set my alarm earlier, and I got up, and I started reading my Bible. And I will tell you, that was one of the best decisions I've ever made. And it is a decision I would make a thousand times out of a thousand times. And I would encourage you, you will never regret that decision. When we look back at many of our decisions, we say, well, that was a good decision, but man, there are a couple things that didn't quite go the way I wanted. That's a decision that has been 100% positive. And it has impacted the trajectory of my life, and it has impacted the trajectory of my family's life. So I would encourage you, discipline yourself. Discipline yourself to read the Bible. This is what Timothy, Paul wrote in Timothy. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. It's not easy. It doesn't like just happen magically. Oh, I want to read the Bible more. I didn't, though. Oh, well, I didn't do anything to actually make it happen. We need to discipline ourselves to do so. So make a choice to read your Bible. Do it today. Now, while the Bible is crystal clear we need to take it in every single day, the how, there's a lot of freedom. There's lots of opinions. So I'm just going to give you some suggestions on how I think you can be successful. First, you need to schedule a time. If you don't schedule a time to read your Bible, you're just not going to read it. It's, that's just the reality. If you don't build it into your life, it's not going to magically like make space for itself. So you need to schedule a time. My opinion is early in the morning. That's an opinion. That's not written in Scripture. But I'd say that's, uh, that would be reflected upon. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom in that. But that is not the Lord speaking. Um, if you, so we need time. Second, we need to remove distractions. There's lots of things that can distract us. For me, years ago, what stopped me was actually the newspaper. I loved reading the newspaper. I still love reading the newspaper. I mean, people don't really read the newspaper much anymore. But I couldn't, like, not read the newspaper. And so I'd start reading it, and I'd run out of time for reading my Bible. So I had to remove that distraction. I didn't actually cancel. You could have an afternoon paper. So I just switched to an afternoon paper delivery. I don't offer that anymore because, well, I don't deliver that many papers anymore. But I had to get rid of that distraction. So what's distracting you from your Bible reading? Is it your phone, social media? I got to check my work email before I start. Put that stuff away. Read God's word first. And then filter all that stuff through what God has taught you. Then have a plan, okay? You need a plan for reading the Bible. Open to random passage can work in the short term, not going to work for the long term. We need a, a, a method for reading. There are many methods for reading. For many years, I used the one-year Bible. Uh, it's a great method. It has Old Testament, New Testament, uh, Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, Proverbs. If you don't have enough time, you can drop some part of it. Uh, it's a really good way of systematically reading. If you get behind, you just skip and you move on to the next day. You don't like the one-year Bible? They're pretty cheap. I think you can buy one for 12 bucks on Amazon. All the different versions. You can use the YouVersion app. Uh, many of you probably have used that. There's a ton of reading plans on the YouVersion app. I used a bunch of those last year. But the key is have a plan. What plan? I don't know. Have one. That's what you got to have. Next, we got to engage with the text, right? We only remember about 10% of what we read. And so we need to do some things to help us engage with the passage so we can remember it. Lots of different ways. An important one is journaling. Now, journaling, I was always opposed to journaling. Being a guy, journaling is for girls, right? So maybe that's sort of sexist for me to say that. But I journal every day. Okay, so that can be as simple as I write a verse in a book that God speaks to me. So that helps me remember. I've, I've read it. I've written it down. There's other ways to journal. I, for a number of years, have used the SOAP method, Scripture, Observation, Application, Prayer, you write down the verse, and then you write down a few observations about it, and then you write down some application to me, and then if you want, you write down a prayer that's related to the application. I like that. It really helps me engage. You can write down kind of whatever you want. There's, again, total freedom. But the key is it's helping us to engage the passage. It's helping us to think about it, to meditate on it. What is God trying to teach me? And then share. Share your verse. I always love Gary's always got his verse. Boom, he's got it out. He's ready. He's ready to share his verse. That's the way that helps us to engage with our Bible reading. So Bible reading, do it. Really good for you. Second, study. We can study God's word. There's lots of different ways. I like what Jerry Bridges said. Reading gives us breath, but study gives us depth. Maybe you're a regular reader. 
And maybe study is what you need to think about this year. Have you looked deeply into God's word? There are things that stop us from looking deeply into God word, God's word. I don't like this quote, but I'm going to read it from R.C. Sproul, and you'll see why I don't like it. Here, then, is the real problem with our negligence. We fail in our duty to study God's word, not so much because it's difficult to understand, not so much because it's dull and boring, but because it is work. Our problem is not a lack of intelligence or a lack of passion. Our problem is that we are lazy. Ouch. I am lazy. I would rather, you know, watch a show, watch a football game, play a video game, veg out, then study. Study again takes discipline. So we need to work at it. How do you do it? Well, there's lots of different ways you can study. You can listen to other people's teachings. Uh, this year I listened to John MacArthur has like 50 messages on Genesis 1 through 12. And they're awesome. And it was fantastic to just listen through those over the last, over like six months is what it took me to get through those. We can read commentaries on Bible passages or other books that help us to better, better understand the Bible. Uh, it's helpful, I find, to study with others. I mean, just going and studying can be a little hard. So it's good to study with others, whether that's part of your small group or separate from your small group. Studying the Bible with other people is helpful. It says, as one man sharpens another, right? That's what Proverbs talks about. So studying with others helps. And then I think another great one is to take opportunities to teach. To teach something, you have to understand it, right? You can't like just be like, oh, here's a verse, I'm going to teach it, and just show up. You, you can't do that. You have to prepare. You have to understand the topic if you're going to teach it. And so I'd encourage you, whether that's in small group or larger groups or even Sunday school, those are great opportunities to teach. They make you study. I need some help to discipline myself to study. And so those have helped me to study. Okay, another one. Probably not a ton of people or some people love memorization, but I think memorization is another important discipline related to God's word that can help us to realize those benefits of Psalms 1. Remember Psalm 1 spoke about the person who meditates on God's law day and night. Now, how do you meditate on God's law at night when you live in a society that doesn't have electricity? When all you got is oil lamps, right? You're not going to get your scroll out and be, let's get this really close to the lamp so I can, no, bad idea. So they had to memorize, and they would bring to mind the passage, and they would think about it, right? It talks about in Psalms, the watchman at night, thinking about what God has said, right? He's kind of just standing there watching, so he's got a lot of time for God to bring to mind his words. And this is what it says in Psalm 119.11. I've hidden your, your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Memorization has many benefits. It can help us to overcome sin. That's clearly what this teaches. If you have an area of struggle, memorization is a great tool. Uh, when I'm tempted in areas, I would memorize verses or phrases from the Bible, and I'd bring them to mind. I was tempted to look at a woman in a wrong way with lust. Bring to mind what, what Job said. I've made a covenant with my eyes. Boom, I made a covenant with my eyes. Nope, can't do that. <laughs> Done. Okay, memorizing those verses. God can use those. He can use those to bring to mind, to teach us, to encourage us, to instruct us, and to direct us. So why don't we memorize? Well, most people would say, well, I have a bad memory. I find as I get older, my memory is, I forget people's names. Like, I'll look at people and be like, I know your name is Nathan, but I can't bring Nathan to my brain for some reason. And it just happened. Maybe I'm getting old and senile. But we can discipline ourselves to memorize things. I don't know if you guys have ever gone to our little memory madness that we do with the kids. Watch these four-year-old children come up, and they shoot off 10 verses in a row. It's really impressive. And I've seen 10-year-olds come by and do 10 verses in a row, weeks in a row. It's amazing what the human mind can do with memorization. Now, maybe those kids don't have as much, you know, junk in their brain, but it's amazing. So we can discipline ourselves to memorize. Dawson Trotman is the founder of the Navigators. When he became a Christian, he was a truck driver, and he wanted to start memorizing verses. And so he would memorize a verse a day. And by the end of three years, he'd memorized over 1,000 verses. Now, I don't know that I'm going to memorize 1,000 verses, 
But I will say there are tools out there to help us memorize. This is a tool we've used in the past. Again, you can buy this pretty cheap off of Amazon. The topical memory system from the navigators, interestingly. Um, have these little cards here. Uh, they're themes. They have a lot of suggestions on how to memorize verses. Uh, and so again, there's lots of tools to help us memorize. There are also Bible memory apps, some of which you can pay for, some of which are free. I've used the Remember Me one. It can be somewhat helpful. Um, I like the topical memory system because it has a structure for what verses you memorize. If you already have that, that's fine. Um, the apps can be helpful with that too. So finally, these are all great ways of getting God's word into our heart and our mind. But there is a danger with doing that. We don't want to just know. We have to put into practice. James 1.22 challenges us. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James later says, listen, if you don't do what you read, you're like a guy who looks in the mirror and totally forgets what you look like the second you turn away. God's word won't produce fruit unless we put it into practice. Jesus, of course, put it really succinctly. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. We need to put God's word into action. How do we do that? Okay, well, you could just say, well, we should do it. Well, we need to read our passages and study and memorize and meditate with an expectation of finding applications, of finding not just information, read it differently than we do news or scientific studies. We want application, things that we can put into practice. God's word is living, it's active. We should expect him to speak. Um, we should make sure we understand the passage correctly, right? But most of the Bible is really easy to understand. Ephesians 4.25 says, Put away falsehood. Let each one of you speak truth to his neighbor. That's really easy to understand. There's no mystery of interpretation and an application there. It says, I shouldn't lie, and I should speak the truth consistently. The issue there is putting it into practice. And so meditate and reflecting on passages help us to discern application, particularly to our personal lives and circumstances. We can also ask application questions, and I like this. This is a sword method of reading a Bible passage. It has a bunch of application-directed questions, right? What does this teach me about God? What does this tell me about people? Are there sins to avoid, examples to follow, commands to obey? These are questions when we read or study or memorize a passage that we can ask of that passage that help us to apply it, because that's the whole goal of this. We don't want to just read or study or memorize just to know. That is not useful. So in conclusion, God's word is what sets us on the right trajectory. It's what will help us to live a successful life, a life that's characterized by contentment, love, peace, faithfulness, self-control. God's word is what, what will set the trajectory of our lives. I want to go back to Psalm 1. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. This is an amazing promise from God, that if you read his word, if you delight in his law, if you take it in, if it's your food, you consider it carefully and you put it into practice. God's blessing on your life will be amazing. So in 2022, let's renew our commitment to God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for your word. It's amazing. It's awesome. God, help us to put into practice what we've heard. God, it's hard. God, I have to discipline myself. I have to do things that I don't always want to do, God, but they're so good for me. God, you're such an awesome God. Help me, help us all to take in more of your word, to take your word seriously, to put it into practice, God. Help us each to have one thing we can do this year with your word, to get more of you, Lord. That's what we want. We need more of you in our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Steve's going to come up and lead communion. Of. Uh, so I always like God's little coincidences sometimes, but for communion today, 
I'm going to share my quiet time thought from yesterday out of what I read, and then I used the SOAP method in my journal to write that down. So it's a good, good tool that I've had uh, in my life. And, you know, I've tried a lot of different things. We experiment, and then we find things that work, and the SOAP one's really good. I, I do find, too, for me, I use the Bible app, but I also use my regular Bible. Highlighting a verse is good. Taking a pen and writing it down is even, even better because there's something with engaging your hand and the paper. So I wrote down yesterday, Isaiah 61.10. I will re- greatly rejoice in the Lord, for my soul shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headrest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. And so that was the verse I wrote down. The whole chapter is really good. If you want to read Isaiah 61 today out of time, I will not do that. But what I wrote down is he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. So he puts that on, <clears throat> and he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. How has he done that? Through the cross, through his death, for laying down his life for me. He has clothed me, he has covered me, and then I just have to rest in that. And so that was my thought today for communion. As we look to communion, we look um, to the bread, we look to the wine, or the juice in our case, is that that's, that's why we've instituted this practice, is to just remember he's already covered me with his righteousness. He's already clothed me with these garments and we can rest in him uh, and really look to him. So that was my thought for today. We're going to take a couple minutes here. Trevor and I, a couple of the other leading men here, will pass out um, the, the cups, and then we'll come back together and take it together. Reminder, the gluten-free, if you're gluten-free, is in the middle. Thanks. Mark 14, 22 says, And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. If you didn't pick one of the uh, annual letters up uh, last week, those are out on the table. 
along with a bulletin if you'd like them. They were hidden back in the thing out there, so you can uh, grab one of those. All right, everybody have a great day.